In John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What does water refer to in this passage? Uh, people have been debating this for a long time. Of course, there is a majority view on it that has been around for a long time. A quite, a quite reasonable one at that. Well, now first, Jesus says simply in verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Well, first, I think it's quite easy to establish what he means by being born of the Spirit. Well, this is the new birth of the Holy Spirit that we read about throughout the New Testament. This is the regeneration that is brought about by the Holy Spirit. When one converts to Christ, comes to Him through the gospel, the inspired message of Christ, of God, and is transformed from an old sinner to a servant of Christ, there is a regeneration. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm starting with this because we got to lay a foundation and we got to know what this means to even talk about what water means. In chapter 1 of 1 Peter, in the end, Peter says it this way. He says, verse 23, For you have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible that is, through the living and enduring Word of God. And then quotes a passage about the Word of God. But notice he says you've been born again through the living Word of God. And he even says at the end, And this is the Word which was proclaimed to you as good news, the Gospel. You see, the, the Scriptures, the Gospel, is the inspired Word of the Holy Spirit of God. So the Bible itself, when you're reading it, you're reading God's Word, but it is the Holy Spirit speaking. And we are transformed by the Word of Christ. It teaches us how to behave. Another scripture says that the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness. So the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the Word, and we are under its uh, influence. And when we apply it to our lives and our heart and our person and our thoughts, it transforms us. This is the fruit of the Spirit, after all. In Galatians chapter 5... Galatians 5, he tells us about the fruit of the Spirit. He says in verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in step with the Spirit. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is righteousness that comes about from the Holy Spirit. This is a character that we adapt as taught by the Holy Spirit. And it is largely done through the, through the Word, the inspired Word of the Spirit. The regeneration is by hearing the Gospel. In Romans chapter 10, it says, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of Christ. Well, we're saved and justified and regenerated through faith. Well, it's a faith that is brought about by the gospel, the word of Christ, which, of course, is the word of the Spirit. And we make the Holy Spirit our character by putting on its fruit, making it who we are. Well, this is a regeneration, a new birth that begins, or rather involves, having the character of the Spirit. And it's brought about by the Spirit. So that much is the easier part. But in John Chapter 3 and verse 5, we have the water. So what does water refer to? Well, my view had been for a long time that it was baptism. And that is the view of a lot of the church fathers and has been around for a long time. And since I held it for a long time, I find that it is a reasonable interpretation. But I no longer believe that that's the most likely case. It could be. I'm not 100% certain it's not. But I think that it's more likely something else. Uh, first, let's talk about another option that is often cited, and that is that born of the water refers to the first birth, the natural birth. You know, in our day and age, we often say a woman's water has broke when she's about to give birth. Uh, 
And so the water that accompanies the new birth uh, is seen by some to be evidence that he's referring to the natural birth. You've got to be born naturally and then spiritually. Now, I don't believe that's the case. Now, it is often dismissed on the basis of that it's somewhat absurd. I've made the same dismissal myself. That Jesus would have to tell you, you have to exist in order to be born again. You have to be human. You have to be here. You know, you had to be born the first time. But you're always trying to be fair. I think I know what they're trying to say. They're not trying to say that Jesus is implying you've got to exist, that you have to be uh, human. But rather, he's just simply saying one birth is not enough, which would make sense. From a Jewish perspective, they thought their natural birth as Jews made them the children of God. But rather, Jesus is saying, nope, you've got to be born twice. That's, that's not completely unreasonable. But I don't think that's what he's saying. Because there's just simply no evidence, historically or scripturally, that water is a way they refer to natural birth, like we do in modern times. It's reading backwards uh, in time, you know, an idea. So I don't think that's the case. Furthermore, grammatically, it's more likely a single birth. That is water and spirit. Now, there's one preposition used with water and spirit. Now, grammatically, in the original language here, that tends towards being a single birth rather than two separate births. It could always have an exception. Grammar often does. But then the burden of proof would, proof would be on the person saying it is two births. Okay, so, but obviously we got baptism as a viable option here, and I think it's quite reasonable. You know, uh, obviously the ministry of John the Baptist, which was a ministry of water baptism, was well known at this time. The Pharisees knew it. Uh, John the Baptist and his baptism is mentioned later in the chapter. And so it's also an ordinance of God that the Pharisees, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, had rejected and so it would be an understandable statement from Jesus to mention it since the Pharisees in large part had rejected John's water baptism. But the reality is, when, the reason I changed my mind is because I think there isn't another option that makes good sense. But the idea of the new birth, regeneration, being connected to water baptism is not found in the Gospels. It's not found in John's ministry or Jesus' ministry. It is true that it is found connected with the baptism of the Great Commission of the New Covenant in Jesus' name. But that didn't happen here. I used to say, well, it's quite obvious. What else, when I was uh, you know, talking about what water referred to here, I would say, well, what else involves water in the New Testament? that is associated with new birth. Well, it's baptism, of course. Well, but not John's baptism. The Great Commission baptism, but not John's baptism. And so, that is reading backwards, which is not what I tend to want to do. And so, without having that connection, why would we assume that Nicodemus would make the connection? Because when Nicodemus hears Jesus say, born of water, what reason would he associate it with baptism when regeneration of the new birth hadn't been that we know of at this time? Now, people say, well, John did say it was a baptism for the remission of sins. Well, the remission of sins does not necessarily say the same thing as a new birth. Because regeneration, I believe, in the New Testament involves much more than just the release of the penalty of sins, which I'll talk about here in a moment. Furthermore, uh, Jesus later says, well, in verse 9, Nicodemus says, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? So, based upon being a leader of Israel, Nicodemus should have understood the things that Jesus just talked about. Well, but uh, being a leader of Israel didn't necessarily mean you connected a new birth with water baptism. But there has to be something in Jewish understanding or their understanding of the Old Testament text that would have 
uh, been a reason for him to understand what Jesus was saying? Well, I think there is. And this is pointed out by many people. In Ezekiel 36, and in verse 25 is where we will begin. Now, I believe the context here is uh, about reinstating his people Israel, and I believe this is referring to the Messianic age that we now live in, the church age, the new Israel, the spiritual Israel. That's a whole other discussion that I believe can be established quite easily. But what he says here in verse, we'll start in verse 24, he says, God says concerning Israel, I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. And I believe in the New Testament, this is uh, spiritualized as the church. But nevertheless, he says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, one that's not calloused like a rock, but soft like flesh, one that can be shaped. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to do my judgments. Well, right here we have two concepts. We have one which is about the spirit, a new birth that involves God's spirit. It's a new heart, and it is his spirit within them. This language of the spirit being inside of us is the idea that we are we adapt the character of the spirit. I talked about that earlier. The fruit of the spirit is supposed to become our character in the regeneration. We have a spiritual mind, as Jude talks about and Paul talks about. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is when your mind is primarily navigated by the interests and desires of the flesh, where that becomes your master, and you get, you're a very carnally minded person. The opposite is to be a spiritually minded person, to think after the Holy Spirit. So that's there, and it involves a new heart, a new birth, a new kind of person. But the other concept is sprinkling clean water. Of course, that's symbolic language. He's saying, I'm going to wash you. I'm going to uh, wash all the filth from you. This is not just forgiveness that he's talking about, but he says, from all your idols and give you a new heart, new spirit. It means it be a new person. That is certainly the regeneration of the new covenant. You see, in the new covenant, we have to understand that it is teaching more than just forgiveness of sins, although that's very much a part of it. But it's also a release from the bondage and corruption of sin. You see, when the angel told, uh, when the angel said in Matthew's account of the birth of Christ that he will save his people from their sins, he wasn't just talking about the penalty. He wasn't just talking about saving them from hellfire. It's saving them from the corruption, deception, and bondage of sin. It's a whole new change of character releasing us from what sin had done to us. This is the cleansing that is certainly involved in the regeneration. And I believe this fits well with what Jesus is saying. Uh, Nicodemus could have understood this from this key teaching of the Old Testament. There's another passage I want to look at that I think ties in with this in Titus chapter 3. Uh, he says, in verse 5, talking about God once again, it says, He saved us not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to His mercy, through the washing of regeneration, regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now, again, though, people may say, well, that's baptism there. Well, that's a reasonable interpretation. I'm not convinced that that's what it is, though. You see, there is another washing, after all, in the New Testament. How about a washing that comes from the blood of Christ? It's the washing of the soul. Now, yes, baptism is associated with a washing. Fair enough. And again, it's the view that this is baptism was one I've held for a long time. But for some time now, I say that it probably isn't. I think this is the washing of the soul. It's not the baptism. It's the washing that comes about by the regeneration. 
Now this term, the, re, the uh, washing of regeneration, this is a genitive. For those of you who knows what that, who knows what that mean, means. If it was baptism, and this is where a lot of people believe it is, like our Catholic friends, and I myself held for a long time, and many people that are like-minded as myself certainly still hold. If it's baptism, then it would be a baptism that brings about somehow the regeneration. This is also a genitive. When it says renewing by the Holy Spirit or renewing of the Holy Spirit, it's genitive just like washing of regeneration. But here it certainly does not mean the renewing that brings about the Holy Spirit. Rather, it's the Holy Spirit's regeneration. Renewing, that is. The Holy Spirit does the renewing. So likewise, I believe that we have to tend to see this grammatically consistent to say that it is the regeneration that brings about the washing. That you are washed when you are uh, given the new birth or when you uh, participate in the new birth. So it's the Holy Spirit that brings about the renewing and it's the regeneration that brings about the washing. Or that once you are regeneration regenerated, the washing occurs. It is a washing of the soul. I think it's the same kind of washing talked about in Ezekiel and throughout the New Testament, the cleansing of our character, where we are washed from the deception and corruption of our sins. And a new character is brought about. And so I believe this fits with John chapter 3 and verse 5. After all, if Jesus is going to say water instead of baptism, the burden of proof instantly becomes uh, or comes on those who say this is baptism. Because after all, if baptism is what he's talking about, well, let me say it like this. In other cases, Jesus just simply is pretty clear in saying baptism. Or when it refers to John's baptism, it refers to baptism. Now, it may say water as well, but baptism is right there in the context, immediately qualifying water. So, if a statement is made that is not immediately talking about baptism, and it's a term not used of baptism, at least by itself like that, water, well, the very fact that Jesus is using a different terminology, I think the uh, proper uh, method of exegesis is to say, I need to start looking for something that's not baptism. Now, if other reasons and things in the text lend you towards baptism, then so be it. Again, I do not find baptism unreasonable. It's a view I held for a long time. Uh, but the very fact that he uses, he just says, born of water. This is not a way of speaking about baptism that we find anywhere else in his teaching or in the Gospels. And so, most likely, just based upon that, it would not be baptism. Otherwise, it would lead to confusion. To talk about baptism in a way that is strange and unusual and not found anywhere else in the text. Associating it with a concept not elsewhere associated with baptism. So I believe for these reasons, it's most likely not baptism. Now, I could be wrong, and it wouldn't bother me. Uh, I, but I don't believe that's... I don't believe it is the case that it is referring to baptism. I think the passage from Ezekiel and the concept of the washing of our person, our character, and the reshaping of who we are and how we think is probably the washing it's talking about, where God has used water s symbolically to cleanse us. It's a cleansing that goes along with the regeneration of the Spirit. That's my view. You may disagree, and that's fine with me.